here we are today at the Great Writer Steel Podcast. I am Kenneth Nichols. We are talking to Eric Gamalinda, a very good writer who wrote a very good book from Akashic Books. It's called The Descartes Highlands. It's a great story about two young men from the Philippines who do not know they are brothers, but they eventually find out. I think you'll really like this interview because not only is the book very good, but Mr. Gamalinda is a very interesting man, and if I can be immodest, I think I asked him some very cool questions. So, without further ado, let's take a look at the interview I did with Eric Gamalinda. And it's coming right now. Hello, we are here with Eric Gamalinda, whose Akashic Books release, The Descartes Highlands, is a fantastic novel uh, about two young men who are joined by having a father that they didn't previously know, uh, these brothers. And hello, Mr. Gamalinda. Hello, thanks for having me here. Uh, first of all, yeah, I want to talk about the, the conceit of the book. Uh, they're, they're two brothers. Uh, they, they're they from the Philippines with an American father, uh, but they didn't know each other because they were they were spread apart by fate and all of those wonderful circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, did you always have in mind to imbue the book with a with a parallel structure uh, that you know obviously joins at some point? Uh, yes, I did. Actually, the original manuscript was actually three consecutive novellas. That's what I call them. Um, and uh, I was hoping that at some point readers would realize that all three stories are interlocked. Uh, and then at some point, uh, it was suggested to me to break the stories apart uh, into alternating episodes. Uh, and, and that was, you know, the, the person who suggested that said that that would heighten the tension and the uh, suspense in the book. Uh, and at first, I resisted that idea. That was the original concept, but I figured that that would be too confusing for the reader. Uh, but, you know, I was I was convinced to give it a try. And um, the, the, the process was actually very enjoyable, uh, challenging, but enjoyable. Uh, it became some kind of narrative jigsaw puzzle. And I had to make sure that each episode interlocked with everything else. So, you know, it was actually fun doing that. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, v- a very cool uh, thing to know about the book. Uh, what was the effect? Uh, obviously, we all make choices, and mm-hmm. uh, so what is the the what was the result of having the stories uh, told in three consecutive novellas instead of uh, the jigsaw puzzle that you mentioned? Um, the the well to to backtrack just a little bit more. The the very first draft of the novel was actually. Uh, written as blogs, as anonymous blogs, which I posted on the internet. Uh, I I wasn't sure how many people saw that, but it was, in fact, entitled The Descartes Highlands. And it was was broken apart. It was episodic the way it is now. Um, And uh, when I cobbled all the episodes together uh, to make them into three individual novellas, the effect I wanted was that after reading the first story, hopefully the reader would be engaged enough to read the second story. He would realize that the second story, he or she would realize that the second story is trying to connect to the first story. Um, and then once once the reader gets to the third story, uh, he or she would realize that the third story is actually trying to wrap up all the mysteries surrounding the first and second stories. Uh, it's basically the same effect that I had wanted to produce for, you know, the, the current version, the, the chopped up jigsaw puzzle version, uh, except that I think with this current version, hopefully the reader gets more engaged in trying to entangle the story because, because the process is more, uh, let's say, hopefully involved. Um, you know, it may be a little confusing in the beginning, but I think I planted a lot of, let's say, clues or leads within each episode for the reader to realize, oh, say, okay, I see, I'm trying to, I'm beginning to um, see the web now, and it is a web, it's a very complicated web. 
Oh, definitely. Uh, I I love that you mention the the kind of connection with the reader and, and the use of digital media and the internet to involve an audience. Uh, mm-hmm. What what is your philosophy regarding that? Some people, uh, you know, don't want to give too much away. Some people uh, want to involve a reader and build an audience first. Uh, mm-hmm. What was your thought about that? Um, the reason I did that was because the original idea of the novel was, you know, the sense of isolation, the sense of loneliness and isolation in a in an increasingly connected world, in, connected by the internet, by email, by, you know, uh, all these digital, uh, uh, all the digital resources that are available to us now. And, you know, when I first started writing that, that was in 2001, 2002, you know, it's hard to think about it, but the internet was still more primitive, more primitive than we know. We know. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, uh, but I wanted to um, make that experience immediate for the reader and for myself. The fact that these two guys are blogging and then at some point they find they find one another through the internet, but but their sense of loneliness and isolation deepens even as they discover some kind of connection. Um, and I wanted to experience that myself as the writer. I often do that. I try to get inside the story. And one way to do that, I thought, was to actually write the story online. Um, I did something somewhat similar uh, with my last book, which was published in 2000 in the Philippines. It's a historical novel about the uh, Philippine-American War in the Philippines. And to get the feel of the era, I actually wrote the entire first draft by hand. Uh, I, I didn't use a computer at all or you know, a, a word processor, as we called it back then, uh, because I wanted to experience what the characters would have gone through if they were recording their experiences or their emotions. They would have used a pen, right? um, a pen and paper. I, uh, that It's a comment after my own heart, because uh, I... I, I just wrote a young adult novel that I, I wrote longhand with fountain pens uh, in a journal that the character would have used, a, a purpley, flowery one, cause, you know, not my style, <laughs> but it was hers. Uh, yeah, so obviously the writing tools are all, they're tools and they, they can be used in different ways. Uh, so what did you learn by composing longhand and, and why, how is it different from using a keyboard? I, uh, whenever I write longhand, I tend to be less verbose. Uh, you know, the, the hand moves slower uh, with a pen than with a keyboard. Uh, I also realized that I was more careful with my language. Um, I, was, I was also careful that I would write slowly enough so that I would be able to read what I wrote <laughs> afterwards. You know? yeah. um, and also because it's... it's it, it's physically more exhausting. Your your hand gets tired easily when you're writing with a pen. You tend to be more economical. You tend to jump into the story immediately. Uh, uh, you know, it's the uh, and, and also there's there's no there isn't as much opportunity to go back and delete and rewrite. You know, immediately. So all the rewriting actually happened as soon as I finished the entire first draft. You know. And it, of course, it's changed a lot because after that, I transcribed every, everything on a word processor, on a word document. So by then, by then it evolved into something completely different. But you know, the, hopefully the, uh, the initial atmosphere was still there. Oh, sure. And it, it, uh, writing longhand forces you to have another layer of proofreading and, and editing. Exactly, uh, right. Yeah, the uh, I I find I, I don't know if you've ever used a fountain pen, but I, I I really love the way that that you think of the words that you're putting down. Uh, they have an they have a, a cost to them because you think, oh, this this milliliter of ink is going to literally become the words on the page. Exactly right, right. And and I did consider using a fountain pen. I I used to use a fountain pen back when you know, I was a kid when I was in high school. I thought it was just 
really cool to be writing with a fountain pen. Uh, but, but so I first tried doing that with a fountain pen, but it was much slower than writing with a ballpoint pen, right? <laughs> so, uh, and I thought that was way too slow for me, so I switched to a ballpoint pen. I, I think what we're saying is that that we should all experiment with uh, with different methods of writing from time right. to time. Right. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Very cool. And uh, obviously, the book is uh, is very much uh, an interesting uh, look at, at the Philippines uh, and, and life there and, and culture. You know, the, the Marcos regime and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you hope to to kind of communicate to teach people? Uh, in America who may not know much about it, what what did you want us to think? Uh, first of all, I think that I come from a long and rich tradition of Filipino-American literature, and I think that a lot of the writers who had come before me had adequately and um, uh, extensively explained our cultural and historical background. I would highly recommend people uh, to read Carlos Bulosan, which is probably one of the earliest Asian American books of fiction published here. Uh, and then there are a lot, a whole lot of other writers who have tried to explain the complex culture that we come from. You know, we were formerly uh, Spanish. And of course, before that, we were, you know, Indo, Malay, Muslim, and then we became Spanish, and then we became American. And now, we are trying to um, affirm what we think is our own individual culture. So oh, it's definitely. a very, it's a very layered culture and a very complex history. Uh, but I touch on just a very specific um, time frame in our history, uh, which may not be familiar to a lot of readers. Uh, you know, readers may not be familiar what exactly happened in 1972 with Marcos. And what they see here is just a snapshot, I think, of, or a, a very small focus on what that whole era was all about. It was very violent. It was very, I think, in my opinion, it was very amoral. You know, a lot of the sense of ethics had disappeared back then. Um, and it was also uh, quite horrific for a lot of people, not just Filipinos, especially Filipinos who were poor and powerless, but in my story I showed that it actually affected non-Filipinos as well, like the uh, the father who gets involved in you know, all the mess that he's, uh, he's involved with. I don't want to spoil the story. Right, no, you. neither do I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, so that, that's what I wanted to. Hopefully, that's what I showed to the readers about the Philippines. Oh uh, yeah, I, I just want to emphasize for you and everyone else. Uh, it, it's definitely not a, a, a cultural studies book. It's not a you know, it's a fun story, uh, and you know, you're you're just using the Philippines as a backdrop. It's not a uh, you know, a difficult read in that right, way. Right. Right. Uh, and, and also, uh, uh, I think the reader would realize that the story happens all over the world, actually. Oh, they're, yeah, they're in New York. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In France, in Thailand. It's it's a, it's a global story. <laughs> uh, in many ways, aren't, aren't all of them global. Right. 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 <laughs> uh, one of the other things that I loved about the book was the way that you approached uh, exposition. Because mm-hmm. uh, it's not uh, you don't have too much exposition to get out, but you do have to mm-hmm. establish uh, a lot of stuff toward the beginning. Right. Uh, and you introduce a Jordan story uh, in the in the beautiful opening chapter about the Descartes Highlands and, and Mr. Bresky and writing a letter to the father on the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you have Matthew uh, talk about his story. Uh, a lot a lot of it's released to uh, his lady friend. Uh, in the kind of conversation that you have with a significant other about your past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So talk about how you decided what you would tell people and when, especially with uh, with Mr. Bresky. Right, right. Well, uh, one of the first things I decided I wanted to do with this book was uh, to have as minimal author intrusion as possible. Uh, And once I decided that, uh, it was easy for me to just... Uh, decide to tell all three stories in the first person. That way I could actually step back and let the characters tell the, uh, the story themselves. Uh, and early on, um, 
I laid out actually what the entire novel is going to be about. It's on page two when the mother tells Jordan finally, this is Gretzky's story. And she tells it in five sentences. That's basically the entire story of the book, the, you know, the entire skeleton of the book. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not unique to me. A lot of other writers have done that. Um, but I wanted, I wanted everything to be clear from the beginning, what the title is all about, what the Descartes Islands is all about, you know, um, where is it and what it means. And then by the second page, this is the entire summary of the book. And then the whole thing unfolds through 300 pages, you know. But uh, it, I, I did that because I knew that the uh, structure was going to be complex. So as long as I thought, as long as I was very clear on what this, the whole basic premise of the story is all about, then I could go ahead and proceed to unpack that, you know, that that summary, <laughs> which which readers will find in the second page. Yeah, uh, I really admired that in terms of uh, sometimes we writers can be kind of cagey about character names or character relationships mm -hmm. and, and basic information, but mm -hmm. you, you lay it out really clearly. My mother and I, okay, first person, You're right. uh, you, the imaginary father, Mr. Bresky, you, tell, you mention they currently live in Westchester, mm -hmm. we know when he's born. He, the next page, you say, I, like you have the character say, "I'm eight years old." Mm -hmm. uh, so things are are very clear, uh, and that which allows you to uh, to get a little bit more uh, have a little bit more fun later on. Right, right, and also um, I think the reader will notice that uh, for the first three chapters, the, the characters actually state their name, um, and I made sure that they did that because. Uh, the chapters, the alternating chapters, are not named after them, unlike, you know, similar structures of, you know, similar novels oh, sure, yeah. that were created before. Uh, I'm thinking of Faulkner's uh, As I Lay Dying, where each chapter is named after the character we're speaking. I didn't want to do that. I decided to do, give each title a separate, I mean, each chapter a separate title, uh, I mean, each each section a separate title. But it was it was important that each character from the get go, from the, their first from the first time you encounter them, they tell you what their name is, so you know it's a different character speaking. Um, and I also noticed on that note, uh, the dialogue in the book, uh, a lot of it is there. There are very few dialogue tags. Uh, the mm -hmm. characters are are just exchanging information and thoughts. Uh, what, was that a conscious decision to to make the dialogue to make that 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 stuff really sparse, or uh, and you could only do it once you establish who is talking and who is in the room? Right, right. Uh, it's something that um, an editor a long time ago pointed out to me. Apparently, I had been using a lot of dialogue dialogue tags before. Uh, and somebody told me you don't need to overuse it. You know, just drop it once in a while just to make sure that the reader is still with you but I, I do I do like that advice so uh, I think uh, you know again it's it's my idea of less author intrusion uh, once you say he says or you know she says then, then that's you you know uh, but um, yeah it's a, it's 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 uh, it's almost like using spices in food you just place you know the, the right amount just to make sure that that everything's still going well. Uh, oh, definitely. I've used that metaphor before. Very cool. Uh, I I I think it also has a cinematic effect as well. Right, right. Uh -huh. uh, when we watch a film, we're not we're not thinking. Okay, now you know now Matt Damon's talking. Okay, now Ben Affleck's talking. You know, uh, we're, right. we're just getting the dialogue uh, and. So, so were you trying to? Uh, I wanted to talk about the, the cinematic aspect because Mathieu uh, is is part of the the cinema world, mm -hmm. uh, and and you are as well. Is the was that the only cinematic choice that you made in the book, or or do you have any other ideas about that? No, there there uh, I use a lot of cinematic oh, techniques. Aside in the from book. that, yeah, yeah. Oh no, no. You talk yeah. about a lot of different films, a lot of French films, yeah. Right. But also, you know, like basic cinematic cinematic techniques, I think, work very well in prose. 
um, now aside from being a, you know an avid film buff myself, uh, I actually write my outlines as almost like you know uh, uh, film scripts. I find them very. I find it easier to visualize the novel through cinematic terms because obviously cinema, cinema is very visual, and then you just add you know the location and what kind of sound and then the dialogue that you need. And then, but I also use a lot of shots uh, that may not be apparent in prose, but but I do like to use uh, a lot of cinematic shots. Uh, one of the most useful, I find, is the jump cut. Um, yeah, I was just thinking that, yeah. Right, right, and you find it a lot in the book. But also, uh, I think the, the zoom in and zoom out works very well, and I, I it, and that works very well, I think, when the, when the uh, scene gets too intense or too sexual, you know. Uh, and one of the one of the tricks that I picked up from filmmakers like Bella Tarr is that when a scene gets very, very intense, they tend to move the camera away from the character and onto the landscape. And I use that a lot in the book. Um, it, it, I think I think the Jordan parts are where I use it a lot. Uh, and also, uh, I used a lot of scenes from my favorite films, actually, and tried to apply them to some of the scenes in the book. Um, I think um, film buffs might recognize some of those scenes. Uh, that's really that's a really interesting way to think about it uh, because I, I don't think that there's a, a battle between novelists and filmmakers, mm-hmm. uh, but but sometimes we are we're too far apart in ways that that we don't need to be. Mm-hmm. Um, do you mind right. if I do you mind if I ask you about a specific example early on in the book? Uh, there is a uh, there's one scene. It's it's I think it's in the middle of the book though. Um, there's one scene where they're in an island, uh, Matthew and his girlfriend, and there's a storm, and uh, and they hear this storm, uh, you know, uh, rattling the wooden windows, and suddenly the windows appear, and uh, I mean the the windows open, and in flies in a flock of sparrows, and that's where I end the scene, and I think people who watch Tarkovsky, uh, especially people who've seen Tarkovsky's nostalgia. Will recognize that um, it's it's a it's a seemingly irrelevant image or detail, uh, but but I don't think so, um, and I don't think it's irrelevant in Tarkovsky's nostalgia as well. But I just love that that for no reason, for no logical or seemingly logical reason at all, suddenly you are surrounded by a flock of sparrows. You know, <laughs> I couldn't help, I couldn't resist using that. As long as it's uh, not a, a Hitchcock reference to the birds, then it's... No, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Ho- hopefully people don't... Uh, you, you know what, that's an interesting... <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. I'm just thinking of film and yeah. Uh, well, I'll, I'll point out on page 79, mm-hmm. uh, Jordan is is with his mother, and uh, they're, they're talking about uh, things are getting a little bit more stressful uh, where they are, and, and uh, the, the, the uh, life life savers life crusaders uh are expressing themselves in a somewhat violent fashion mm-hmm. uh and you describe a, a pipe bomb going off and injuring the mother mm-hmm. uh so it's on it's on page 79 maybe i'll i'll post like a, a, a scan of the section like you know a mm-hmm. couple paragraphs uh so you know uh, obviously a, a an explosion is something that's a lot more powerful on screen uh, visual right. and audio, uh, right. but but you make it very powerful. Uh, you, you have the character say, I, I, f- "I find her sprawled on the stairs. She's cut and bleeding. I carry her out of fire exit. She's staring at me. Her mouth moving without words. Her eyes wide with shock and gratefulness and relief." Uh, and I thought of Janet Lee just now, like in in Psycho. Uh huh. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Spoiler alert on Psycho. Right, right. <laughs> uh, but then, the, the, what you're talking about, I, you make a, the choice to, you have white space, and then you describe, you have a paragraph about how how to build a pipe bomb, take right, a steel right. pipe, stuff it with gunpowder. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that another of the kind of cinematic uh, uh, tricks that you were trying to play with us, or, or what was your thought on that section? Yes, um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out 
how to describe it, uh, an explosion. And you know, it's it's and I realize it's not easy. Um, uh, I think the uh, knee jerk, um, um, you know, the, the intuition is to is to actually describe the uh, the effects of the of the bombing, the physical effects, the uh, um, you know what happened to the place and all that. And I decided I didn't want to do that, but I didn't know at first how to describe the horror of an explosion without without having to resort to the usual, you know, the, the usual tricks. Um, and one way that I that I thought I could do it was first to describe how, it's almost in slow motion, uh, he, he sees the light uh, lighting her dress, right? And it's almost like an x-ray that he sees, an x-ray right. of her. Um, and then when, when he finally gets to her, I didn't want him to describe, um, you know, the surroundings or whatever. And this is where I use the, uh, the uh, zoom in, you know. Right, he, right. He zooms in on her face, on her expression. And I thought that would be a more powerful powerful way to describe the, the effect of the bombing, the, the look on her face rather than what was going on around her, outside her. I, I but, love I love that because that, that's kind of exactly what Hitchcock did do uh, in Psycho. By, right, right. Yeah, by yeah. by showing the 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 awfulness of it by just letting us see Janet Lee's empty eyes. Right, right. And and he didn't actually see. He, you don't actually see the actual stabbing. Right? No, you no, no. See, you just see her eyes and her face, and and it's more horrifying to 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 watch that, right? Well, and that's the whole point of, of yeah. Uh, it's not the it's not that that there is a bombing or that there is a, a stabbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's the after effect and and how it affects the the world and the people in it. Right, right. And I think it's more powerful to um, to imply rather than to show the actual violence. You know, um, it's it's a it, not just Hitchcock. And I'm I'm a very big fan of Hitchcock, but there's there's a the German filmmaker, uh, the Austrian filmmaker Michael Haneke, um, uh, had this really horrifying film called Funny Games, and it's about these two two guys who torture a family for no reason at all. They just want to do it. You don't see the actual physical torture. Everything is implied, but what's implied is so horrific that you actually cringe. You you can't bear to watch the film, and yet you realize you're not watching anything at all. Everything is implied, you know. And oh, I think definitely. That's, yeah, I, I think that's it's really uh, that's a very fascinating way to uh, to portray the scene. Well, I, I love what you're saying, and it, it leads me to want to ask kind of a, a bigger question. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's interesting that that uh, the 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 authorial theory, the theory of the author, came out of you know prose and out of Ben Johnson, you know, 400 years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but the auteur theory it kind of belonged to film and, and took a while to develop. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in what ways uh, is is a prose writer the, the like the director of a film how, how are they sep- how are they uh, alike and how are they different um, I tend to equate one with the other because because like I said I try to imagine prose you know my prose in terms of film um, and you know one of the things I'd like to do eventually is to actually shoot a film <laughs> uh, but um it's, I think one, there's this a lot of, of commonality, a lot of fusion between the two genres, I think. Uh, of course, you know, in, in, in a book, you can be more expansive. You can go anywhere without the physical limitations of a camera or a shoot, right? So, so a film in that sense is a bit more limited in terms of expansiveness. Um, and of course, a book that's translated to a film has to be translated into specific film terms, which means space and time and, and technology and everything else. But at the same time, film, because it's visual and it's oral, 
add so much more, so many more dimensions to the story that a book cannot because, first of all, the, the image and the sound is very immediate, right? And you don't even need words to uh, convey what, say, a book may have, may take several pages. In, on, on, on film, it can take just a few seconds to state what the book has been trying to say. Uh, but I find that that whole uh, conversation, if you will, between the two mediums uh, fascinating and useful. I wonder how they can be, uh, perhaps someday there will be some kind of, I'm sure there has been somewhere, uh, a, a, a film that is contrived uh, with the intent of melding it with prose in some, in some kind of a fun way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you know, I, I'm, you, are you thinking of people like Godard or uh, Peter Greenaway uses a lot of text in his films, uh, in, in Godard as well. Oh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm thinking kind of like a smell of vision, but with prose instead. Like, uh, I, I, I wonder, I wonder how you could have the two. I, I know they do because you read. Uh, uh, novelizations of, of films will mm-hmm. will include information that wasn't in the film, and and so there right. is there is a conversation going on. But I wonder how you could like make the make the two smush them together in a more concrete way. Right, I, I'm sure it's going to happen at some point. Very uh, cool. Somebody's probably thinking about it right now. Just... I I hope so. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, you you have the joy, in my opinion, uh, of living in New York City best city mm-hmm. in the world, uh, and there are about 10 trillion bookstores. Uh, right, right. Uh, do you have a favorite? Can you Do you want to uh, give a shout-out to one or two? Oh, sure. I, I love going to the Strand, of course. Uh, who doesn't love going to the Strand? Um, and, you know, I buy a lot of my books there. Uh, there's also a little bookstore up near Columbia where I teach. It's called Book Culture. Um, and I find a lot of very interesting, rare scholarly titles here so I'd like that story as well I, I love finding really really old uh, scholarly texts and, and how to books and, and, and uh, it, it's just amazing what people told each other in you know in the 30s and 40s and 50s about how, how to be happy and, and all those kinds of things I just find it fascinating mm-hmm. definitely mm-hmm. very cool um some basic questions because writers often don't discuss these things with each other. First of all, uh, in general, how do you usually compose your first drafts? Um, I take a lot of notes first. I let the whole story percolate in my head. Um, and this is for me the most enjoyable part. It's actually what I'm doing right now for my next book. Um, and try to figure out where the story is going, what works and what doesn't work, but all in your mind. But, you know, as of course, as I take down a lot of notes, and I do take a lot of notes. Um, and then at some point, I'm not really sure how this happens, but at some point the book tells you that it's ready to be uh, written down. Um, and once that happens, I write my first draft in white heat. You know, I close myself off from everybody for a month, a couple of months, and I write, uh, I want to say non-stop, but I don't. I have a certain kind of schedule that I follow when I'm writing so that I don't burn out. Um, so I write a lot early morning, probably for a couple of hours, probably more if I'm really inspired. Um, and then I force myself to stop um, and then just do normal things that normal people do, you know. <laughs> Um, and then I revise at night, um, and then I outline for the next day. Um, and this is something that I do so that I don't get writer's block. Um, I have to know what I'm going to write the next day. And I keep doing that until the, uh, the whole thing is done. But it's, it's very hard to do it when you, you know, when you have a job, when you have to pay the rent. Um, it always helps to get some kind of residency once in a while. Um, where you're just focused on your work and they take care of everything else for you. Um, that always helps. That always helps to get the first draft done. Oh, definitely. I, I, I love the idea. I always like to think of it as percolating. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, I, I do the same thing where I'll, I'll let things percolate for a long time 
and then uh and and I do also like to kind of stop a little bit before where I could keep going mm-hmm. uh that way you know the next day I have I have a, a it's kind of like a cliffhanger I I have what I want to say next and it's a springboard into the next section right right exactly very cool uh once you've done all that once you've outlined and and gotten that out in that white hot burst what what does your revision procedure generally look like uh my my motto is uh, edit without mercy. So, um, and you know, I go back to the very first page, and then I clean it up. Um, most likely, I would actually restructure the entire novel. So I would actually tear it apart. Um, so th- the first draft usually doesn't survive my my editing process. Uh, I usually write a completely new second draft. Um, saving just a few bits and pieces from the first draft. Um, and then it keeps going on. Um, I just keep restructuring, revising, um, changing characters. Initially, I don't edit my characters, but then in the course of revision, um, that's when I start editing them, especially if they start sounding not the way I wanted them to sound, you know. Um, but, but I revise a lot. Um, I was I was revising the Descartes Highlands up to the last day that I was allowed to revise, you know, and um, um, I just can't seem to stop. Um, there's always something that you want to uh, be better or, you know, uh, clearer or more striking or whatever, you know. Um, and then, you know, my, my inner critic is very harsh. Um, sometimes I have to silence my inner critic, but <laughs> no, definitely, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, but but yeah, I do, I do edit myself mercilessly. Yeah, I think we all have that kind of desire, and and it's a very cinematic, you know, film kind of thing to want to primp and 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 fix everything until they have to make the prints of the film to send out. Right, right, exactly. Very cool. Uh, now you're into a lot of very you know, very cool stuff, you know, Godard, classic film, uh, but I'm guessing you have a narrative guilty pleasure, reality TV, or there's <laughs> got to be something. Honey uh, Boo Boo? You like Honey Boo Boo? You know what? I don't, I'm kidding. I don't, I don't watch a lot. Of, I don't watch a lot of TV. Uh, last summer, I got one of those those flap antennas only because I wanted to watch the, the World Cup. But, <laughs> but, um, I don't. I don't watch. I mean, I now that I have this antenna, I surf a lot, but I don't really watch. Well, you know, once in a while. Last night, I think I saw uh, Modern Family. It's kind of funny, really funny. Well, <laughs> it's interesting that you say that because uh, Modern Family, the structure of the episodes, uh, in some ways resembles that of of your book. Exactly. Right. Yeah, the the uh, three independent families entwined in some way. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I will say that the World Cup, uh, it, it is a kind of narrative. It is, isn't it? Oh, it's 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 amazing. It's an epic story, and it's it's you know all these wonderful characters and all this drama and tension and emotion. You know? I'll say it's more for me, but but I I try to get into soccer because I know you know billions of people around, across the world love it. Mm-hmm. I, I I I I swear I've tried. I just can't get into it. Could, could you give me any advice on how to appreciate it? You, you might well, you might need your Virgil. You might need somebody to lead you to, through the whole thing, because you know to understand what's actually going on. And I've, I've been fortunate to have a lot of friends who are really, really huge soccer fans. So you know, when when as much as possible, when I watch a game, I watch it with them, and then I ask them. Wait, what's so great about that? Why, why are people, you know, jumping with joy? And then they explain to me, oh, because this shot was, it could have been this way, but he did it that way, you know. Um, and they also taught me a lot about who the teams are and who the players are. And I started researching on the players and their personal histories and all that. So it's it's a, but you do need, it's it's not something you can jump into on your own. I think you need some kind of guidance. Very cool. I'll, I'll, I'll look for that next time the World Cup comes around. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I would love to hear about some of your primary mentors in writing. Who Who's helped you out along the way? 
Oh, um, a lot. Uh, well, my, my mom, basically, uh, when I was a kid, she really encouraged me to write and to read a lot. And to read a lot of serious books, you know, when I was, I think, 10 or 11 or something like that. And she realized that there was no way she could stop me from being a writer. She gave me a book for my birthday. It was, um, and she said, if you're going to be a writer, you better start reading books like this. You know, it was, it was Nabokov. It was Nabokov's thing. And, and at first I was terrified. I was, I was like, okay, this is not, kind of books I've been reading before, you know, it's not, doesn't have pictures. Um, but, you know, she, she introduced me to a lot of authors that I still love today. Um, and now I'm returning the favor and introducing her to authors that I like. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, I had a lot of really good teachers in the Philippines, uh, a lot of writing teachers, um, a lot of writer friends who told me what to read and, you know, um, or, or how to fine tune my work, uh, and I have a lot of writer friends, uh, and of course, you know, all the writers that that I've read throughout my my life uh, have all somehow influenced me. It's probably you probably don't have a lot of time for me to name all right, 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 you know, six thousand of them, <laughs> but but I think you know a lot of the writers that I you know that I do find enjoyable, still have some effect on me. I mean, Dostoevsky, obviously, has set a profound effect on me. Um, Camus, um, I like Camus for his life philosophy as well as for his work. Um, and I do like Proust a lot, um, especially the new translations. I started reading the new translations. They're, they're amazing. Isn't um, I, one of the things that, that you, you just can't tell people and you you have to experience they have to experience it for themselves is that you know a, a, a translations are different and, mm -hmm. and they do change the meaning you know you'll work with students who oh it's no big deal you can't you can't magically beam that that understanding into their heads they just have to have to experience it themselves right right and especially today because we're so used to such a fast-paced media environment it's very hard for Young people, especially when I was teaching literature and writings, it was a little hard to try to convince them to get into the wavelength of a certain book because that's what you have to do initially. Um, you know, it's, it's a completely different wavelength, but once you ride the wave, then, then you get, you know, sucked in and then it's just, you know, and it's easy. It becomes easy to read the book knowing that you're on the same wave as, as the writer. But but to get to that that kind of consciousness I think is getting harder and harder for a lot of people. And and it's a it's a, a self it must be a self directed journey. Right, right. You, only you can do it for yourself. You're right. Oh definitely. Um and I would love to know the most important question is uh you mentioned the book that you're working on. What should we look for from you next? Uh, <laughs> it's uh I think it's it's I think it's going to be something that a lot more people may be able to relate to. It's mostly based, you know, the stories the stories happening mostly in the states, mostly in New York City. Um, but you know, it's about the only thing I can tell at this point is that it's about a character who suffers from a an unusual affliction, you know, he's an immigrant from the Philippines, uh, and he's never been able to adjust to his new time zone. Uh, you know, uh, the Philippines is 12 hours ahead, so it's actually uh, early morning there right now. So uh, after living for so many years in the States, he still lives in Philippine time. So his life is lived in the dark at night. Um, so a lot of the most of the story actually happens at night and I think that's a clue that this is going to be yet another dark novel very cool oh <laughs> I, I, I would like to point out for for readers uh, that that the Descartes Highlands is not a uh, it's not a difficult read and it's not um it, you don't have to be uh, Filipino or immersed in that culture to enjoy it uh, it's it's about Jordan and and Matthew and their 
their general understanding of the world and, and who they are. So it's, right, right. Yeah, so it's definitely very accessible. Uh, so thank you very much, Eric Gamalinda. Thank uh, you. Everybody should check out the Descartes Highlands from Akashic Books, and uh, we hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. See, wasn't Mr. Gamalinda as interesting as I said he would be? Be sure to check out Great Writer Steel to find an exercise that I've posted based upon our conversation today. Uh, as you know, there are hundreds of essays about what we can learn from books, short stories, poems, all kinds of creative writing. So check out the website. And remember, I'm Kenneth Nichols for Great Writer Steel. Shakespeare did it, so should you.